Hey guys, welcome back to the Investors Podcast, new YouTube series where we review the greatest books for business and life that have shaped our learning over the years. Hi, I'm Sean, and this channel is all about the principles of investing. From stock tips to iconic billionaires, the best strategies, and our favorite tools, the Investors Podcast has everything you need to know. So let's get started. Today, I'm going to be sharing my biggest takeaways with you from Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini. In an interview with our very own Robert Leonard on Millennial Investing, Dr. Cialdini says that his motivation for researching the book stemmed from frequently being exploited by salesmen, promoters, and others he calls compliance professionals who are experts at manipulating our psychology in subtle ways to push us towards a desirable outcome for themselves. Charlie Munger actually says that this is his favorite business book ever written and Buffett ranks it at number three. And if you've ever been to a Berkshire meeting in person, you've probably seen it for sale. This is a paradigm changing book for me to read, which is why I'll break it down into my six biggest takeaways. So let's go through each of these to see why Buffett and Munger speak so highly of it. And be sure to check out our other book reviews in the links below after this video. All right, here we go. In researching this book, Dr. Cialdini systematically immersed himself for three years in the strategies of advertisers and salesmen to better understand their techniques. He describes himself as a spy who blended into these various organizations by entering sales training, fundraising, and advertising programs dedicated to getting people to say yes. The book's goal here is to help society better understand how, quote, automatic influence occurs where compliance practitioners can shape and determine your response by targeting your subconscious. Building off of this, he explains that we exist in such an incredibly complicated reality, we must have behavioral shortcuts to function normally. Without these features, we'd stand idly by analyzing and considering all the options before us while the time for action fades away. As an example, chapter one tells the story of a friend who had recently opened a jewelry store and she was having trouble selling some turquoise items. Frustrated that customers weren't interested, she told her employees to mark down the prices by half while she left to travel for a few days. When she returned, the items were all sold as she expected, but her employees had mistakenly doubled the item's price and not discounted them. With this puzzling dynamic in mind, she approached Cialdini to discuss how the jewelry could have sold faster at double the price. He cites this as an example of the mental shortcuts we take routinely. The explanation? Well, often we default to believing that more expensive items are of a higher quality. Most of the time, this is true, and paying a higher price tends to provide us with better products. So in seeing the higher prices for the jewelry, shoppers were convinced that the items must be exclusive and of a higher quality simply because they were so expensive, which compelled them to make the purchase. Dr. Cialdini calls these her heuristics weapons of influence which make us vulnerable to exploitation. In one case from a 1930s tailor shop, employees would opportunistically manipulate unsuspecting new customers to pay higher prices via a tactic where one man would yell to the back asking how much to sell a suit for. The man in the back would frame the suit as being very high quality and then suggest it's worth at least $42. The salesman in the front would yell back again as if he couldn't hear and the customer would hear the man say the suit should be sold for $42. The salesman at the front would then mistakenly quote the price at $22. So the customer would eagerly purchase the suit thinking that they had accidentally gotten a great deal while still being overcharged. Clearly, the customer's perceptions and emotional impulses are used against him in selling a cheap suit not worth any of the prices quoted. Another example is in how retail stores often instruct their employees to pitch the most expensive items first, as cheaper items will seem relatively more affordable and make customers more willing to spend greater sums of money simply based on the price of the first item presented to them relative to the cost of everything else. There are countless ways like these where we are misled or manipulated into making purchases. So let's go through my takeaways for dealing with the other weapons of influence outlined in the book. In chapter two, Dr. Cialdini explores the principle of reciprocity and its use as a weapon of influence. 
He explains that sharing resources and skills are fundamental to human nature, as in the past, we've evolved from tight social networks of support and specialization that enabled successful population growth. So this feeling of indebtedness and our commitment to repaying it defines our success in maintaining relationships with strangers. We will often go to great lengths not to appear to be ungrateful, though others may see this sense of obligation as an opportunity. So in one study, when selling raffle tickets, sales increased significantly when the seller had previously done a small favor for the customer before pitching them on raffle tickets, in contrast to those who received no favors. In this case, the raffle ticket seller pretended to gift unsuspecting people extra Cokes that had cost him about 10 cents, while these receivers of the Coke on average purchased 50 cents more of raffle tickets. For the salesman, this is a 400% return on investment. Not so bad, huh? Have you ever felt obligated to buy an item at the grocery store after accepting a free sample? This is the principle of reciprocity and it's so potent that whether we like someone else or not, the desire to match a debt overrides our emotions towards them. So we may be compelled to respond favorably to others who we would otherwise not help or like simply because they have done a small favor for us. Cialdini tells the story of a religious group, the Krishna Society, who used this principle in their favor. By pushing religious texts into the hands of passing people in public or giving them flowers and not accepting them back but instead insisting that they're a gift, the group was able to drastically boost their fundraising efforts from people who would have otherwise found them unsavory. For me, this provides a great example of my first takeaway from the book. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, pay every debt as if God wrote the bill. But to build on that, only do so if it's a legitimate debt. When you feel trapped in a sale from either, say, accepting a gift basket, a free sample, or some other token gift, consider whether this was delivered in good faith. If you suspect it's only a compliance tactic, well, feel no guilt in politely saying no thank you. In the next chapter, Cialdini explains the principle of consistency, which I'll show here with an example. One study found that after placing bets on a horse race, the bettors have higher conviction in their choices than they had before making the bet, despite no fundamental change in the underlying probabilities. So this taps into our inclinations to justify our actions. Our desire to appear consistent with what we've already done is strong and subconscious. We simply convince ourselves that we've made the right choices and no doubt feel better about the decision. Of course, we all fool ourselves from time to time in believing that we've made good choices. This, in reality though, is a highly potent weapon of social influence. In one study of this, on a beach, a person would leave their radio playing while going for a walk. When a fake vigilante came up and stole the radio, only four out of 20 times did a neighboring beachgoer attempt to stop them. However, in another experiment, when the victim would ask a neighbor to watch their things, 19 out of 20 times they attempted to apprehend the thief. Their earlier commitment had bound them to action by their desire to appear consistent. Without consistency, our lives would be chaotic and disjointed, though implementing this heuristic without thinking can be a disastrous shortcut at times. From Sir Joshua Reynolds, there's no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the labors of thinking. There's a special and more binding effect actually of making our statements public. When held to our claims by the judgment of others, we will often be more committed to upholding them or achieving our goals. For example, there's a great story of a woman trying to quit smoking. By writing each person in her life who she valued from parents to colleagues and romantic partners, she sent all of them her written commitment to stop smoking. While quitting cold turkey was the hardest thing in her life, she attests that every time she felt the urge to smoke, the image of a loved one losing respect for her and breaking her commitment flashed into her mind. And there are sales techniques dependent on this principle of consistency as well. Once people have been induced to change their self-image, they may extend this new behavioral pattern beyond the original context. Car dealers often use a technique called throwing a lowball where they offer a very cheap price to certain customers. They then let clients grow committed to a purchase, test drive, and sign basic paperwork until they then report that there was an error in the original pricing and they must pay the higher, more regular price if they want a simple luxury like AC. Essentially, they entice customers to buy a cheaper than normal car, convince them that they chose this car on their own, 
and then request that they pay the regular amount once committed. Inspired from Leonardo da Vinci's words, my second takeaway is that it is easier to resist at the beginning than at the end. Meaning that if you can resist frivolous enticements and other poor decisions, we can avoid the delusions of self-justification and consistency that will bury us deeper into a decision. And as a bonus, if you're going to commit to personal change, hold yourself accountable by making the decision public like the woman quitting smoking and do it in a way that failure would be so embarrassing that it's not even an option. For chapter four, Cialdini discusses the principle of social proof. Here, we determine what's correct by first looking to see what others seem to be correct. Social evidence then provides a nice behavioral shortcut the majority of the time, though this can still be abused. As an example, try going out and staring into the sky for a minute in a crowded place. Almost no one will stop to notice you. Try it again though with a group of friends all staring up together and a great many passersby will stop and inquire as to what's going on. One study showed this with 80% of passersby stopping to see what a crowd was looking at. In uncertain situations, we are particularly likely to follow others' lead, such as times of quote pluralistic ignorance where safety in crowds isn't actually so safe. Studies have shown that when we observe emergencies, our likelihood to act diminishes as the number of people surrounding us increases. This social phenomenon relates to the deferral of individual responsibility and collective inaction validated by the social proof principle. Since everyone hesitates to determine whether there's truly an emergency and how best to respond, they look to each other for guidance which fosters the possibility that brazen crimes can be committed publicly without so much as a single bystander bothering to call the police. This is not because of their indifference per se, but because of the powerful subconscious influence of social proof to paralyze their actions in the moment. And in horse races, many gamblers don't have much familiarity with the horses, so they default to the most popular horse with the best odds. An early better can then distort these odds by placing a bet on a horse they actually expect to lose. When others see this bet though, they infer that the first better must have some special insider information, so they of course follow along. This effect compounds as more people pile in. The early better can now bet on his true favorite at much more favorable odds. Once again, social proof is most strong for those who are uncertain and therefore look to the guidance of others. My third takeaway is then best captured by Walter Littman, who says, we all think alike, no one thinks very much. As investors, we must be particularly rigorous in questioning how the thoughts and feelings of others shape our actions. Does hearing others speak favorably about a stock make you more inclined to buy it or feel more validated in your decision? Well, it probably does, and this doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it does open us up to painful losses perpetuated by the ignorance of crowds. So look no further than the 2007 real estate crisis for evidence of this. And if you want to get better at thinking for yourself, reading is of course a great tool for self-education, though how many of us really have time to sit down and read full books these days? If you're watching book review videos like these, you can probably sympathize with that. But for this book, I actually used Audible to quickly listen to Influence while on long car drives and while walking my dog. So check out our signup link below to begin listening to your wish list of books today. Chapter five begins by highlighting that unsurprisingly, we prefer to say yes to people we know and like, though we may not realize how many people use this against us to ensure compliance. When trusted friends promote a product, we are much more likely to make a purchase on behalf of our friendship, obligation, and social bond. When friends invite us over to sell things like jewelry or Tupperware from home parties, we are explicitly aware of how the principle of liking is being used against us, yet we still comply. Clarence Darrow says the main work of a trial attorney is to make a jury like his client. And there are a great many reasons why we may like someone ranging from simple commonalities to compliments they pay us and even their physical attractiveness. Studies have found that we automatically assign intelligence, talent, and honesty to attractive people subconsciously. An attractive political candidate is likely to receive far more votes despite voters explicitly denying this and attractive workers tend to receive 10 to 12% higher pay and even greater leniency in criminal trials. Attractive defendants were twice as likely to avoid jail when found guilty. 
And interestingly, criminals offered cosmetic surgery had far lower rates of reincarceration. For compliments, the idea that someone fancies us or claims affinity bewitches us, though in reality, they typically want something from us. One salesman sent his 10,000 prospective customers a greeting card every month with his name and a message stating how much he likes them personally. Sounds pretty cheesy, but this worked quite well for him. Familiarity also plays a strong role in liking as well. One study showed that when a group of women looked at photos of themselves, Individually, each one preferred the inverted version, which matched what they saw when looking in the mirror, while their friends all preferred the regular photo that matched what the person looked like to the rest of the world. So we prefer the familiar even if it doesn't match reality. For advertisers, familiarity is a big deal. Sponsors spend millions to be the official brands linked with popular events such as the Olympics. The official tissues of the Olympics may seemingly have no correlation, but this association with athletes drives a more favorable assessment from customers. The connection doesn't have to be logical, just positive. We are all Pavlov's dogs. So my fourth takeaway is to always separate your feelings for someone from their proposition to you. If you find yourself abnormally favorable to a salesman you just met, perhaps they're just a friendly person, but more often they may be trying to appear likable just to sure up your purchase. Chapter six is about authority and how we defer to those who we perceive to have power or influence. This video is actually a great example of it. Without reading this book, you don't know whether any of what I've said today is true, but your default is to probably believe it. In the Milgram experiments, researchers learned to what horrid extent will actually follow the authority of others. Participants were asked by researchers to administer shocks to other participants every time they failed to memorize something correctly and to stop under no conditions. The participants inflicting the pain on others who were actually just actors pretending to be hurt often shockingly proceeded with torturing the other for their failed answers up until when the shocks would have been nearly fatal. This was astonishing of the researchers who had underestimated the participants willingness to follow directions so explicitly and apply shock so faithfully. And further, failure to obey authority is a story told commonly to invoke fear across human history. Look no further than the iconic story of Adam and Eve and their tragic disobedience which has since plagued humanity with the burden of sin. While the ability to conform and comply has genuine practical advantages which can produce efficiencies in learning, we often obey authority blindly, even when it is unreasonable and disadvantageous. One story shows how we will accept authority through association as well. For example, one coffee brand marketed the health benefits of their coffee with testimony from a famous actor known for playing a doctor. Despite the actor having no real medical experience, the ad was a huge success as viewers were inclined to believe this authority principle through his appearance. So my fifth takeaway is to always consider whether someone is truly an expert and whether they have any incentives to mislead us. In investing, Wall Street firms may be experts, but they often profit from selling us on their particular strategy. And other times, people may give you unsolicited advice, but if they're not experts, well, it's probably not that useful. Moving into my last takeaway, this section is about the principle of scarcity and G.K. Chesterton has a great quote for this. The way to love anything is to realize it may be lost. One study at Florida State shows us and highlights how scarcity warps our perceptions. When asked to rate their dining hall food, students said it was poor, but later when told there had been a fire and the dining hall was closed, they rated the food drastically more favorably despite no changes to its quality. As a rule, in the world of collectible items, if it is rare or becoming rare, the item will likely gain in value. So extending further, we are heavily impacted by loss bias. In business, managers are shown to be more impacted by losses than gains, and this has been seen in stock investing as well. So not only are we driven by scarcity, but we are further influenced by the pain in losing possession of a scarce asset. One common sales tactic is the lost availability of items in retail, as salesmen invoke a verbal price commitment while an item is perceived to be unavailable until the salesperson finds an extra of the item in the back. So this is also an example of the consistency principle. Another example is the Romeo and Juliet syndrome, which imposes scarcity through a parent telling their teenager what they can and cannot do. 
particularly in their relationships, which drives the teenager deeper into their affinity for their partner. One study found that romantic feelings for another deepened as parents place greater restrictions on them. And competition can extend scarcity's power as a weapon of influence even further. Salesmen aren't just taught to highlight how much others like a product, but to convince an uncertain buyer that there is a competition with others over a scarce supply. In the US, we see this tradition unfold every Black Friday after Thanksgiving as evidence for how competition can make us zealously interested in things we'd otherwise not care for. So my sixth takeaway is to avoid scarcity's temptation. Ask yourself whether you want something to experience it or just to possess it. When driven by competition, our primary desire is to simply possess something, as the mere act of owning it provides social value and bragging rights. This is probably the hardest weapon of influence to resist, but if we can recognize a mounting internal tension over social pressure and competition before it climaxes, we might save ourselves from a number of regrettable decisions. That's it for this week, guys. Please like, subscribe, and share your comments below if you enjoyed it. We love hearing your thoughts, so tell us what are your biggest takeaways from this book, and which book should we review next? For more on influence, listen to Stig and Preston's classic We Study Billionaires podcast in the book, and check out our video on delivering happiness where we teach you the habits of legendary tech founder Tony Shea. All right, see you guys next time.